Hello, everyone. Welcome to ConscienciaRadio.com. And this is a special interview, a follow-up interview with uh, researcher Joe Jordan from CE4 Research up in Florida in the United States. And today we have a very special interview prepared for you. Uh, it's going to be with the evidence at hand. Many of you question Joe Jordan. Uh, many of you question his research and um, vast array of information that he has presented on our show. But as Jordan uh, says... Don't question me, question the evidence, okay? And today, you asked for it. We have the evidence at hand. Today, we're going to be speaking and interviewing a very important uh, witness of the evil hand of Satan himself on planet Earth. Uh, she was a victim of terrible circumstances, but now she found her way back into Yeshua HaMashiach's heart. And Mary L. Porter will be on the show today with us. Uh, so, Joe, are you there? I'm here. Thank you for having me on again. Likewise, Joe. It's a pleasure to have you on ConscienciaRadio.com. Uh, it's our pleasure to be able to uh, be the vehicle or the path to helping more people in the Hispanic community around the world to listen to your very important message. And I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share the message with this whole new realm that I have not really been able to touch over the years, being English-speaking only. So, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to have these translated into Spanish to reach millions more people who are affected by this phenomenon. And believe me, Joe, I mean, more than 7,000 downloads of the MP3 file we put online uh, when we last interviewed you uh, back in September. And uh, what we've been seeing is on the website of ConsciencialRadio.com is a lot of people uh, replicating the information online on blog sites in Spain and South America. I just finished an interview in Peru yesterday uh, on Nationwide Radio where we talked specifically about you and specifically about your research and all the evidence that you have been presenting. So, yes, it's overwhelming because most of the people in South America and Mexico, as you might imagine, they are believers in UFOs. They are believers that the UFOs come from outer space, that they come to help mankind in this uh, terrible circumstance that the planet is in. And they really, truly believe that they are going to be saved by little space aliens. So uh, I think it's very important that we share your information in order to open up a, a healthy debate in the Hispanic community so uh, they can uh, join us in this fight uh, to uh, unraveling the truth. Absolutely. And, you know, any of your listeners out there that would like to use any of the information that I have on my website at ce4research.com, feel free. You don't need my permission. All of this work was given to me by the Lord Jesus Christ as a ministry to be able to share freely with the rest of the world. So feel free to use anything I have there. Feel free to share the videos with friends and neighbors and acquaintances that might be caught up in this phenomenon. It's there for you to use. Wonderful. Thank you. I would like to start with a prayer, if it's possible, Joe. Uh, would you like to do it? Sure, absolutely. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this wonderful opportunity to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be able to share testimony to that gospel being authentic and real, and that testimony being a life changed because of the grace of Jesus Christ, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we ask that you open the ears of the listeners that are out there and let them hear something, possibly for the first time, to bring this all home to them. People that are involved in this phenomenon, people that are questioning, what is it about? Is it real? How does it concern me? Let them be able to understand through this personal testimony of Mary Porter, who has been through this experience and is also free from this experience, that they may understand it. Through Jesus Christ, there is a hope and an understanding that this phenomenon is not what it appears to be. And we just ask you to be in our midst as we come together and share this evidence, and we believe this to be the most powerful evidence in the world today of the testimony of what these experiences are about. And we thank you for being with us and guard over us and watch us as we go through this show. And we ask these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Uh, also, Father, I would like to add something, uh, if I may. 
Um, uh, King David uh, said once in Psalm 1839, For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued un under me those that rose up against me. And we thank you, Father, for giving us uh, your uh, protection, your guidance in everything that we do, that we may be able to put on the whole armor of you, our God, our Savior, that we, meet, we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, uh, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wit wickedness in high places, as you have clearly shown us, Father. And that's why we put on your armor, Father, so we can uh, be strong in the end times that are to come. Amen. Amen. All right, Joe. Thank you. Uh, Mary, uh, Mary Porter is a very interesting woman. Uh, we're going to be talking with her today. And Joe, so uh, let's, let's present Mary. Let's see what she has to say. Uh, let's learn a little bit about her background. I don't know uh, if we can start with that. Sure, we can. And I guess let me give a little foundation for the listeners uh, that are maybe listening to this research for the first time and maybe not familiar with what I do. Um, I'm a UFO abduction researcher. Um, I'm president of CE4 Research Group, which is an alien abduction research investigation group here in uh, the United States out of Florida. I have a lot of different people that have been working with me over the years to try to get answers to what this experience is about. I am a Christian, so I look at this from a Christian perspective. And we believe that we have evidence to show what this entity is that perpetrates the UFO and alien abduction experience. And we also believe that we have evidence to show what the purpose of the experience is in the first place. And I always tell people, don't trust Joe Jordan, like Alexander said. Trust the evidence. Okay, I can bring the research and show it and lay it on the table. And I could say, trust me, what I'm showing you is real. Or I can say, trust the evidence, because it's the evidence that stands firm. It's the evidence that shows you what I have been given and what I have found in my research is real. And that's what Mary is today. Mary is a person who has been through different types of paranormal experiences, occultic, metaphysical, new age, all through her life. And at one point in her life, just recently, in the past couple of years, the truth finally was able to come to her, and she was able to be set free from all of the oppression, the hurt, the shame, the guilt, the family separations, and everything else that comes with people who have these type of experiences. It's not a good thing, most of you know, if you've had these experiences, to go through this. I mean, it, it never seems to be a positive effect. It always, it's always a detrimental effect. And that's part of a red flag that comes up that makes us question, what is this experience really about and what is it for? And we can also show through Mary's testimony, which she'll be explaining, how you can be set free from all of that oppression that comes with this experience. And this is something that the secular researchers even today say is not possible. They say that these experiences cannot be stopped. But yet I've worked with over 400 cases, and I have right at 100 of them documented publicly on my website that you can see as evidence that, yes, this experience is not what it seems, and it can be stopped. And that's why the purpose of Mary's testimony tonight, to let you listen to her as true living evidence, not from Joe Jordan, but from the evidence itself. And Mary... What we'd like you to do is maybe take us back. There's, there's some questions that, you know, I ask people when I do the investigations and, and look at their, their background. Because we found that these experiences are triggered by one of three different ways. Either people openly ask for it, and believe it or not, I've come across people who do. I've been at UFO conferences working my table there, and people come up and see I work with abductions, and they say, oh, I would really love to experience that to know what it's about. Be careful what you ask for. There are people that actually ask for this experience, and they do get them. The second one were people that said, I don't really know why I had this experience, but through investigating them and talking about what they've been involved with, we find out that there's almost always 
an occultic New Age metaphysical background prior to these experiences happening. And then the third one that came to our attention over the past decade of research, it puzzled us for a while that people came to us saying, I've had these memories of experiences since I was a child. Well, that puzzled us because we didn't believe a child could purposely ask for these experiences because they really don't know anything about them or even unknowingly be involved with things that would cause this experience. So it made us look in a different direction. And I started asking them what their family life was like and asked them what their parents were like. Do you know what your parents were involved in? Do you know what their belief systems are? And in every instance where people said they've had this experience since they were a child, you could see by their answers that the open doors to this experience came from the family itself. In other words, there wasn't a proper spiritual covering from the head of the household over the family, and these experiences were able to happen to the children. What you're going to see in Mary's testimony is, I believe, all three. From what I've listened to her testimony, I think that she would, there was a time where she got to actually asking for experiences. There were times where the experiences happened and she wasn't sure what triggered them. And she can also tell you about how the experiences started when she was very, very young. And that's where we'll start, Mary. Give us a background on family life and back to your earliest experience. First, buenas noches. <laughs> buenas noches, Mary. Gracias por estar en Conciencia Radio. Thank you for being on Conciencia Radio. It's a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you so very much. Wherever the Lord is concerned, I'm, I'm there in a heartbeat. I love him so much. Um, Joe, that's quite a loaded question. Going way <laughs> back, we're born into sin, so we just step into it, don't we? And as babies, sometimes things are done to us. Um, I think that's where it began with me. Uh, I really didn't know, obviously, my first experiences in life were incest with my father and a rape by my Nazi uncle and starting from as far back as I could remember and um, horrendous experiences, those things were done to me, so those, those were handed to me. Uh, there was a time when I was 10 years old, I was out going for a walk in the neighborhood with my best friend Bart McKinley, and he was a science fiction fanatic, and I knew nothing about that sort of thing. He was just kind of a cool guy that had glasses, and I wanted to have glasses so I could see better too. <laughs> We were walking down the street, and we were on the corner of uh, Spruce and Meadowlands Drive, and we we heard a noise, and we looked up above our heads, and we saw two flying discs, the typical 60s notion of how flying saucers should look, silver and spinning and just whirring around, and we both looked at each other and screamed and ran home to our mothers, and I told my mom about it, and of course I was admonished make a long story short, the next day on the radio, the announcer that read the news in the morning said he had received dozens and dozens of reports from people who had seen the same thing. So I looked at my mother and basically I told her, you lied to me. See, they were real. And of course my mother hadn't seen them, so what was she to think? Um, my family, my parents... We were divorced when I was about two years old, so I grew up in a single-parent home. My mom struggled very hard in a small town to make a name for herself. She was a Roman Catholic and had left the church when the church excommunicated her because she was divorced. She gave up on God, or so she said. I have two older brothers. My father was an Anglican. And in his family also was incest between he and his mother. So I see a trail of that being handed down. And no, that was not handed down to anybody in my family by me. <laughs> the Lord um, has been so good to me in my life as I go back at these things. Uh, I'm amazed at how he protected me and kept me so innocent at the same time. Uh, is there more you'd like to know, Joe? Chuck. Can you tell us of any experiences um, other than the sighting of the UFO? And I want to bring uh, just to your attention, Alexander, and your listeners. Yes. Um, her description that she gave of 
this time period, which was in the 60s, of seeing this UFO with her childhood friend, the description, and this is very interesting if your listeners caught it, is it's like right out of the sci-fi channels and or the movies that were of the time. And that's real interesting because what she saw related to the time period. In other words, we see different types of visuals for these so-called UFO crafts as the decades go on. What, we're, what people are reporting now is so much more futuristic and high technology compared to like the description that of what she saw back in the early 60s. Okay, and that's, that's something that's very important as a researcher to look at. Why would they change? And it's, in, in, it changes with the time and it changes with the culture. And that's something that even researcher Jack Vallee uh, one of the early pioneers into UFO research was even recognizing that this UFO experience actually changes through cultures and changes through time periods in the culture because reports go back, we know, hundreds and hundreds of years. That, that, that's very interesting that you mentioned that, uh, the pattern of changing or morphing the so-called uh, ships into uh, a futuristic uh, uh, time set um, it brings my attention to what happened to me back in, um, I don't remember if it was 1984 or 85, I was uh, young, it was Halloween night, It was uh, I was in Coronado, California, where I studied, and my mom saw it in the sky, we saw it in the sky, this huge UFO, I mean, it was like a, a shopping bag, you know, those brown paper shopping bags, upside down with all these uh, lights on the bottom, shining and spinning around, and we saw it in the sky, all the children saw it. It reminds me that it was an awkward form. It, was, it wasn't an airplane, a helicopter, or anything. And we were used to uh, seeing airplanes and helicopters because we lived right beside North Island Military Base in Coronado. So, uh, the air base. And what's funny about that is that when I was a kid, I mean, I, I saw it looks like a shopping bag upside down. But today we're seeing more advanced, uh, stealthy aircraft hovering over over our cities. This reminds me of Coronado doing some research on this, that in, um, in 1994, uh, six people were simultaneously abducted from a hotel on Coronado Island, uh, while um, uh, most were able to recall their abduction by gray types. One had retained actual physical proof, an implant. Now, uh, MUFON did the research on this, Preston Ten Dennett, uh, yes. Gives eyewitnesses, uh, eyewitness reports and detailed information about this horrifying event, including medical effects and photograph, photographs of this event in a book called The Coronado Island UFO Incident. So, uh, again, relaying the, the, the hot spots or the events. I mean, all this is uh, tied into something very, very sinister, as we can see. So, let's go back with Mary so she can still uh, relate to us her her experiences. Thank you. Yeah, Mary, take us into the next point in your life and, and just take us through a progression of, of a timeline of different involvements and different experiences that you had and try to share what brought you in deeper and deeper into this as you take us through this timeline. Yes, okay. Um, I had a very tumultuous childhood because obviously I was seeing things that weren't there and I was told that continually by people. Uh, I was very abused. Um, Satan seemed to use um, sex as a, a number one tool to abuse me. I was uh, raped when I was 14 the first time um, by... This is difficult. It, it's a long story. I was raped when I was 14, and, and that's how my virginity was taken from me. Uh, tobacco farmers, I ran away from home when I was 14. I was staying at my aunt's house, the aunt of the Nazi uncle. And when I was 19, I was living with a man far too young, and also uh, raped by this man. I became pregnant by this man. And subsequently, my mother had talked me into having an abortion. I did some pretty terrible things, but progressing along, it was always sexual proclivity. 
until I thought I'd met uh, a wonderful man. And actually, he, he is a wonderful man. Uh, I married into a man who had a very large Roman Catholic family, and uh, they were country people. And the parents were both born on farms. They were very staunch Roman Catholics, went to church every Sunday. Uh, lovely, lovely people. But I was never accepted into that family for some reason. There was always something wrong with me. I was always different. I didn't do what they told me to do. I just never fit in. And I began to see things then. Um, part of it for me, thinking back now, I was told so many times that I saw things that weren't there. So all of a sudden I started seeing things. But they were very real to me. And... I started to develop some sort of gift, the New Age would call it, I guess now, uh, where premonitions would come to me of, of some sort. One was Princess Diana, actually. It breaks my heart even to this day. I was on my honeymoon with this this gentleman, my, my second husband, and we were high atop the mountains in Puerto Rico. And... There had been a series of about a dozen signs leading up to this. And every time I saw a sign, the sign was a red cross on a white background. Something would happen and I would just get jarred. And my husband would look at me and say, what's the matter with you? And I said, I don't know, look, there's another red cross. And there were a series of signs such as uh, we had a little accident in front of the American Red Cross building in San Juan. Um, I was... Died El Castle of City of Spawn. There was an accident, dark blue sedan. Uh, the police was there. Um, there was a bicycle on the ground with a basket on the front. And then I saw a red cross in the back of the sedan. We met a, a man that was weekending for the weekend in this guest house high atop the mountains in Puerto Rico. And he, his name was Paulo, and he said he had just begun a new job with the American Red Cross. So I kept seeing Red Crosses everywhere, and there was about a dozen of these signs. And Paulo and I, we were talking and getting along and having fun. He said, oh, well, I'd like to, you to inter introduce you to my fiancé. And she came walking around the corner, and she was the spitting image of Princess Diana, and nearly fell on the floor. And I guess I must have gone white in the face or whatever. And apparently I actually even took a step backwards because my husband said, you know, what's wrong with you? This is matter. And I stepped back even further and I whispered in his ear that they were going to murder Princess Diana. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, I don't know. They're going to murder her. And he said, who? I said, I don't know. And he said, what is it? And I said, well, they're going to murder Princess Diana in a French-speaking country in a dark blue car, I can't remember at all, but everything I had said and seen in all these signs, they all of a sudden just lined up, boom, 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 and they came out. I was very upset. I had to go back to my bed in the guest house and lay down for a while, and when I woke up, basically, the information was taken from me. I, I didn't remember it. I don't know why, because I was so horrified. There's absolutely nothing you can do with information like that. I mean, what was I supposed to do? Pick up the phone and call Oprah? Oprah, please, call Princess Diana. She's going to be murdered. I mean, that's crazy. Well, and you could, I just, you, yeah, you couldn't do that. I, I mean, I know what you're going through, uh, what you went through. Uh, but uh, what's your take on, on these type of experiences uh, with respect to the synchronicities of these uh, red, red crosses popping up everywhere? Do you think it's a... It's a uh, I don't know, you're tapping into... Uh, the, the timeline of future events, or is, is it that, uh, Joe, what do you think? Or is it uh, a sign, a divine sign from, uh, from, from God? Or how could we interpret this? Because I get this a lot. I mean, I, um, I could see well, things also in, in this form of pattern forming. So it's very interesting. Please go ahead. And I'll, I'll give you my perspective on this as I've worked with a lot of this over the years. And what I'm seeing here, if you look at Scripture, if you look at Scripture, God's messenger angels, when they came and shared a message of something that was to happen, it always includes the who, what, where, when, and how of journalism. It's very specific in the message. Okay? Okay. But when we get... 
these types of experiences and we're not walking our walk with God, people that are involved in metaphysics or New Age or the occult, and they get these types of images, it's never in a form that it's absolute who, what, where, when, and how, oh, and that it can be something that can, can be prevented. There's always a, 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 an aspect of it where it can't be, you can't do anything about it. You know, you get little hints. And what it's being used as, I believe, by the enemy, by the dark side, is a seduction for these people to become more involved in the, the occult. Because they feel gifted, they feel they have an ability, and they feel that this must be something very important, and it makes them very feel very important that they're getting this information most of the time. Um, I don't think that she felt very good getting this information, but it's an attraction, it's a seduction by the dark side to get you hooked in. And I believe that's another open door that the enemy uses you know, because it's a counterfeit. Everything that, that Satan and his minions use is always a counterfeit of God's real works. You know, that, that if you're a Christian and you understand the gifts of the Spirit, the word of knowledge followed by a word of wisdom, what to do with that knowledge, and prophecy and interpretation of prophecy, all of those things are gifts of the Spirit of somebody who is a walk-the-walk -walk believer. Okay. But the enemy counterfeits that, and it's never a full, a perfect counterfeit. There's always a fallacy to it. Exactly, because John, when he uh, was speaking to the believers, uh, he, he, he calls them the beloved. He says, we are not to believe every spirit, but to test them as to yes. whether they are of God. And why he, he did this is because there are many false prophets, right, uh, that are out yes. in the world. And uh, one didn't know because one didn't follow Yeshua when that happened to uh, Mary or it happened to me. Uh, but we can't believe every every spiritual sign we see as from God or of divine origin because uh, that's how uh, we can fall into this trap, as you mentioned. Okay, Mary? Yes, I, I agree with all of that. The... the Premonitions that I used to get were quite vague, um, mimicking details. Yes. Such as, such as the Princess Diana story. There were a series of about 12 signs and different things, and all around those different things was the Red Cross. But there was nothing written in stone, so to speak. It was, right. It was blurry. It's like when people go to get their fortune told or... They go to a, you know, a psychic and they do a reading on them. It's always so general and so vague. And it's always one or two little things that they know to hit on that'll grab your attention and go, oh, she, how can she know that? But, you know, there's an art to doing that. I used to be involved in the New Age myself and I saw how these people do this. You know, and, and it, it's, it's just a manipulation of conversation is to be able to, to grab on the odds of striking on something that you recognize, you know, is there. And if they can just get you to grab on to that one thing, you feel like they're getting a special message. And then the good possibility that some of these people are tapping into the dark side and they do have information that they can share that they know about you. But the whole thing is it's nothing that can act, actually do anything for you, you know might make you feel good for the time being, but it's never anything for your profit, you know, to, to make yourself better or to, or to help you change your course of life, you know, where the word of Jesus Christ absolutely does those things. In Jesus' name, so be it. So be it, amen. So basically what we're seeing here is that um, we have all these uh, uh, truth sayers out in the world uh, in the New Age circuit, you know, giving lectures, expos, and life expos, and conscious expos. I mean, I just went to August to L.A. to deprogram, you know, most of the audience, and they went nuts with my message. You know, there's only one true God, and it's Jesus Christ. He came to save us. There's no other way back unless you accept him in your heart, you know. And um, there was a woman there in L.A., uh, she came up to me after the, the talk I gave, and she said, look, I'm practicing Reiki. I'm about to go to a Reiki course. What should I do? I shouldn't go to that? And I told her, no, because you're, uh, you're dabbling with the occult. Uh, 
Reiki is dangerous. Uh, and then I felt the, the Spirit of God go through me, through my heart, and push her. And she was like, what are you doing to me? I said, I, I'm not doing anything. And she felt this energy hit her. Uh, after two weeks, I saw her again, she t and I told her, what did you experience? And she said, I saw Jesus Christ speak through you. I saw him in your eyes. And she was crying at the moment that it happened and the moment afterward. But since then, she has not accepted Jesus totally. And I told her uh, last time I went up to Los Angeles, you have to accept him totally and renounce to everything that you've been doing because she's being attacked every night right now by these beings that come down from the from the ceiling of her room at night and abuse her sexually in front of her husband while he's sleeping they paralyze him of, or something so it's it, it, it turns to um, all this starts to connect and make sense when we start listening to Mary's story go ahead please I just want to say one thing that Father God put in my heart recently that really pulled it all together for me because it is very confusing to the secular world because they, they cannot see. Their eyes are closed and their ears are closed. They just simply cannot see. But what Father God put on my heart was in the secular world when I was there and many, many people, they're always chasing the secret of life. They want to know what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? What is this all about? And they continually are seeking that. And I sought that. And for me, what I sought my whole entire life, all I ever wanted, I only wanted one thing. I wanted love. That's all I wanted. And I believe this is what a lot of people, in, well, all people are seeking, is love. And we can never, ever know love or understand love or feel love, not truly, until we meet God. Because God is love. And when he comes to us and we accept the Lord Jesus Christ into our hearts, then we receive love, and it's the most awesome love in the world. And until we feel that love and understand that love, we can't possibly give it out. There's nothing else in the world I want now. Nothing. Every exactly, Mary. Every cell in, in my body was vibrating uh, when I, I felt his presence, you know, when I accepted him the first time. I could feel him here right beside me, you know, uh, touching me, you know, with it, with his love. It's it's a love that's undescribable, you know. You can't explain it in words in this third dimension uh, because the, the language that we have uh, lacks the words to explain how awesome and overpowerful uh, um, the, his presence is, you know, when he truly works through us. So, yeah, I know what you're you're, you're saying. Um, and so let's let's keep on going here with uh, with Mary's um, narrative uh, with respect to uh, what happened next, Mary. After th these things, these visions you started having, what what started happening next in your life that got you caught up into the New Age movement and all that? Well, I had a lot, excuse me, a lot of visions and whatnot, and my husband was beside me. He was a very good man. Please don't ever misunderstand that. Very loving, very gentle, a very good father. There was an issue that was between us, and it was the Jezebel spirit in retrospect. I became very sick because I wasn't listened to. Bottom line, I wasn't loved. I was closing down as a human being. And I began drinking very, very, very heavily. I was drinking at at my worst a two-liter bottle of wine all by myself in an evening. I mean, that's pretty bad. And I gave birth to my last daughter, and I developed a very deep postpartum depression. So I was put on medication. I was put on medication to put me to sleep at night and to wake me up in the morning. And I was drinking. I made a medication at night to put me to sleep with the amitriptyline, and it made me blossom into 247 pounds. I was very unhappy. Because I was so obese, I developed type 2 diabetes. I was put on more drugs. I was put on drugs to regulate my heart or my metabolism or blood sugar. I, in short, I was on seven different prescription medications, and I was drinking about two liters of wine a night. I was a mess. And one day, I was up in the bathroom, and I was smoking on top of it, blowing smoke out the window in the bathroom, because my in-laws were downstairs. I didn't want them to know I was smoking. <laughs> Silly. However, 
at that moment, on the left side of me and filling the whole room, I heard a voice. I'll never forget that voice. And that voice said to me, I despise your ways. And it totally freaked me out. That I thought, who is that? Who said that? And I'm walking around the top at the uh, top of the house. Who is that? Who's, is that you, Carl? I don't know. It's just... Okay. I never did get to the bottom of that until much later in life when he spoke to me again, but I don't want to jump ahead to the story. From there, my husband lost his job. He was downsized in the company he was working for, and we went back to his childhood neighborhood, so to speak, in Cornwall, Ontario. And a few years later, I couldn't take it anymore, the isolation, the devastation. I went to my medical doctor and I asked her to take me off all these drugs because I, I, woke, I got very drunk one night. And the next morning, my husband said, do you know what you did last night? And I said, no. And I looked in the mirror, and I had a deep gash underneath my eye and a gash on my leg. He said you were stumbling around, and I, I didn't even remember that. I just remember looking in the mirror at myself thinking, I'm killing myself. So I had gone to my medical doctor, and I would asked her to take me off all prescription drugs, and she said, no, you're too sick. And I thought, I'm not sick. I'm just really unhappy. And I looked at her, and I said, well, how am I ever going to know if I'm not depressed anymore unless I get off the drugs? And long story short... I took myself off all medication, cold turkey. Rather, I wasn't born again then, but looking back, I know his father held me up because I took myself off every single drug to cold turkey and lived because apparently you're not supposed to do that. I was on a very high dosage of Effexor. It was 750 milligrams of Effexor, and you're supposed to go off that gradually. I could have killed myself, but <laughs> I didn't. But the Lord was there, and he helped me. Within nine months, I'd lost 110 pounds. I was off all the drugs, and I decided I was getting healthy enough. My husband didn't help me. The doctors didn't help me, so I couldn't go out and help myself. I walked out on my husband and my little girl, and I stayed with my mother for a little while, and running ahead quickly in the story, April 2008, I got in the car with clothes on my back and a few suitcases and drove across Canada to Vancouver, British Columbia, where I met a woman on the beach who turned out to be a channeler. And I was lost. I didn't have a lot of money. I just knew I wanted to be away from my mother, away from my life. I just left everything and ran. And this channeler told me how special I was, and I had so many gifts, and I'm a healer, and I could heal thousands of people, and she was going to help me get a job and a place to live, and she did, and she was a very nice woman, and I love her dearly to this day, but she's deceived. She thinks she's talking to God. She thinks it's God telling her all these things, and I know now that no, it is not God. God does not channel. I want you to know something, you know it. <laughs> And uh, I ended up sharing a house with this lady, and uh, she introduced me to Conscious Planet, a, a wonderful place in Vancouver. And they held a weekend conference with these two women from Hawaii that were teaching an ancient practice from the Himalayan mountains called Kunlun. I'd never heard of such a thing, so I went to the conference and they showed us the positions of this particular meditation because this is what it is. And, and what it is basically is channeling energy, grounded energy from the ground and bringing ascended energy from above to meet in our bodies and to travel through the chakras and reach a state of bliss. Who doesn't want to go to bliss? I mean, terribly unhappy people. Wow, bliss sounds pretty good. So I tried it. And you know what? It was kind of cool. I was laughing. I was happy. I was at peace. I thought, this is wonderful. Oh, my gosh. I found the secret of life. This is it. And I quit my job. I was working in a real estate company at the time. And I hopped in the car with these two ladies and traveled down the west coast of the United States. We went to Portland, Oregon. Uh, we went to all over Arizona, Tucson, Phoenix, Flagstaff. And in between 
conferences, we would have three, four days off, and we decided at one time while we were up in Portland to go and take a trip over to Trout Lake, Washington. At the base of Mount Adams is a ranch run by a gentleman who is a UFO person. Uh, he believed in God, apparently. He's a very nice gentleman. He would take people in off the street, feed them, give them a place to stay. Uh, very hospitable. And I was with these two teachers that were teaching the Kundun, and we met this gentleman. They had already met him. And we would do the Kundun practice in a, what do you call it, a pyramid that he had the guest house we were staying in. And we went upstairs into the pyramid and they would do what is called table tipping. There would be one person on one side of the table and another person on the other side of the table and they would call in spirits, entities, ascended masters. Bingo. And uh, Sorry? I'm sorry, bingo. That's the, that's the key word right there I was waiting for. <laughs> That these people use always this uh, um, jargon in order to refer to some form of uh, high elevated spiritual help that they're receiving from um, from some unknown source, right? Go ahead. Absolutely. I sometimes I remember their names, sometimes I don't. For some reason, right now I remember one they were calling in was ISIS. I had no idea who ISIS was, but apparently. They loved this Isis. She was a wonderful person and beautiful and would come in with this powerful energy and lift them all up and zap them with energy. And I was sitting there thinking, what are you talking about? What are you doing? I, I don't feel anything. I don't see anything. So, of course, I thought there was something wrong with me. You know, everybody else was, you know, laughing and having fun. I didn't fit in. I thought, well, here I am again. I don't fit in again. There's something wrong with me. And... Then they started telling me that quite often Jesus would come to visit. And I said, you know Jesus? And I said, well, I don't know him, but I, I know of him, yes, of course. And they were telling me that he would come to visit. And he was very sorry that the world had decided to make a religion in his name. Because that wasn't why he was on earth. He was on earth to spread a message of peace. And apparently when he died, he, he didn't ascend to heaven. He went off in a spaceship somewhere. I'm just looking at them like, what are you talking about? What do you mean he went off in a spaceship? That makes no sense to me. Oh, you haven't seen ships? I said, what ships? And now, next thing I know, ten minutes later, we're outside. It's dark. It's ten o'clock at night, and we're in a field, and we're watching UFOs. I'm going... What is that? And they're showing me. And within two hours that evening, between 10 at night and midnight, I saw 49 different ships. That was just one night. Other nights there'd be 22. Other nights there'd be 34. Whatever. Every night, between 10 o'clock at night and midnight, these ships would come in. And we saw blue ships and green ships and red ships and gold ships. And they're way high up at the sky. Some would do acrobatics. Some would power up very brightly. And the way to see the ships, they instructed me that you have to have great love in your heart and you have to give them permission for them to manifest themselves to you. And that was a big mistake. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so I'm out in the field going, love, 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 I love you, I want to see you, etc. This is not true, Father. You know that. And these ships, they would show themselves. The gentleman that owned the ranch had a laser red laser gun that he would shoot up in the air and it was like a pointer and it apparently it went up five miles or something and he would shine the laser on these ships and say power up and they would they'd get bright and I was in awe I was like wow what is this so that was my introduction to the UFOs and um, I wish I should wish I'm a Christian now I'm not supposed to do this I pray I never ever see one of those things ever again in my entire life I found out afterwards, after God had pulled me out of the enemy's camp in Costa Rica, that's a, another story, I'm jumping ahead, but I found out after that this gentleman and this UFO place, it was a Luciferian cult, 
and they had initiated me into this cult and they had put me through a healing exercise. I hadn't told you about this part, Joe. My ex-companion is a Hare Krishna man and we had gone to the owner of the ranch for healing and we had a question because of all of these earth changes that were supposed to be coming up. Mother Gaia was going to wash herself and the earth was going to tipple topple and oceans were going to flood New York City and mountains would come crashing down and California would disappear into the ocean because the earthquake would come. So we were concerned about where we should live because my ex-companion, the Hare Krishna man, lived in California. And we thought, well, that's not a good place to live. So we had to ask the owner of this ranch if we could go through a healing exercise together and if we could ask this question and ask the spirits where it is we should go. So we went in the Kunlun meditation room, which is adjacent to the main farmhouse of the ranch. And the gentleman who owns the ranch and his assistant did the table tipping, and my ex-companion and I sat on either side of the uh, table. There was four of us around the table. And the healing session began with a prayer, of course, to the universe. And my guide was brought in, apparently. I will not say the name. And I was introduced to this guide. And the gentleman on the ranch described the man to me. And I went, oh, my goodness, I know who that is. And I finished describing him to the gentleman that owned the ranch. So we were on the same wavelength, and I'm thinking, how did he know? He must really be real. He can see him. That man, I saw him in my head. It must be real. So I believed him. And I'm listening, and he took me through progressional healing. He knew all about the incest of my father. He knew about the rapes. He took me through various ages where horrible sexual abuse had taken place and apparently he healed these things and then he asked my guide if I wanted to be if he wanted me to be initiated into whatever it was they were initiating. I said, What do you mean you're going to initiate me? He said, Well then you can talk to the UFOs anytime you want. I went, Oh, okay. So he initiated me. And it wasn't until later I found out I'd been initiated into a Luciferian UFO camp cult. We asked our question. My ex-companion went through the healing, same thing with him. Um, we asked our question. We asked the man who owned the ranch if he would ask the spirits where we should go. We were going to join our lives together. And the first suggestion that we had was Hawaii. We asked, well, is Hawaii a good place to go? Because my ex-companion owned nine acres of land outside Hilo. And the spirit said, no. So then I asked, well, maybe we should live here around Washington. You're living here. You're doing fine. You're all set for the earth changes. The spirit said, no. And then my ex-companion said, well, maybe down near Kevin. And we hadn't thought of that. And I said, yeah, well, what about Costa Rica? And the spirit said, yes, Costa Rica. Go to Costa Rica. So that's how we ended up, this man. He was the man of my dreams, and I love him dearly even to this day. We are equally yoked and cannot be together. I had to leave him. We got on a plane from Los Angeles, California, and flew to San Jose, Costa Rica. And we arrived to see his friends, and we stayed there for about a week or so. We ended up calling that the prison house. Um, it's kind of a joke, but it's not really because these two people would take in rescue dogs, but they didn't get along. Uh, so they had three levels of dogs outside their house, meaning there would be the courtyard where three dogs could have rain and do whatever they wanted, and then there was fencing. And then inside the fencing, there were three more dogs that could have free rain in that, that area. And then right next to the house, there were three dogs that could go in and out so there was three, we called it the prison house, because you couldn't go anywhere without upsetting the dogs. They'd be snarling and, oh, lovely people, but it wasn't the place for us. Next, we went to Gracia. Gracia's beautiful. 
part of Costa Rica. I love the Costa Rican people. The Tico people are some of the happiest people I've ever met in my whole entire life. I'd be happy, 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 no matter what was going on. Happy, happy, happy. They had um, a huge heart, these people. No matter where we went, we were welcomed. They were friendly. They were courteous, polite. Uh, just wonderful people. And Gracia, I fell in love with Gracia. It was the first time in my life I saw a flock of parent, parents. I thought, who knew parents flew in flocks? I was just absolutely in awe. And, of course, we saw the Costa Rican parrots and beautiful birds and wonderful people, but the mountains there weren't for us. Um, we didn't feel settled there. There's another part of the story. Joe hadn't told you yet. It was one day we were staying at the guest house. A wonderful woman from the United States owned it. Um, her son, Charles, lived in Chicago, and he was there visiting and there was one day, I don't know what happened to me, but I thought I was losing my mind. And my ex-companion came into the room, and he found me out on the balcony. He says, what, what happened? What, what's the matter with you? And I said, I said, I'm really, really unhappy. I don't want to live. And then I remembered my unknown teachers who said to me, if you ever find you're in deep, dark trouble, cry out the Master's name three times, and he will come, and he will fix whatever is wrong. So in my head... I called out this master's name three times. And all of a sudden, this huge wind came in and cleared away whatever was going on outside there. And I felt okay again. And so I was feeling settled. And I said to my ex-companion, I told him what happened. And he's kind of looking at me because his Krishna beliefs aren't quite the Kunlun beliefs. So we were stuck between a rock and a hard place. He's a surfer. He was unhappy in the mountains. He wanted to be near the water. So I said, well, let's go down to the water. We ended up in a beautiful condominium right on the ocean, uh, central Pacific, Costa Rica, absolutely beautiful. Palm trees, wonderful sunsets. We thought, oh, we made it. We're going to stay here and you know, live happily ever after. However, God had other plans for me. Things fell apart very quickly. I met a sister online through my daughter, beautiful Dory Lynn, and she was in the New Age, and she was alone, and we got along very well, and she was in Minnesota, and I was in Costa Rica, both of us unhappy, <laughs> and we would email back and forth and back and forth, and all of a sudden she started to change, and she started to talk about Jesus. The Father was calling her, and I thought, what is going on here? And... Things were happening around me in Costa Rica, and one night there was a lightning storm, the likes of which I never want to live through again as long as I live. The lightning was so strong and intense, the building was shaking. The whole condominium complex was shaking. It was only three stories high, about 12 condos in each building, but they were all shaking, and the lightning would come down, and it hit the beach, and it rearranged the entire beach, about a, I don't know, a football field at the beach, maybe bigger, it just totally rearranged it, opened up the tributary river, and it was flowing a, a huge gorge in the beach, that's how powerful it was, it scared, scared me, you have no idea, <laughs> and my ex-companion had grown up on the shores of the Pacific. He was born and raised outside of Los Angeles, and he knows all about storms and ocean. He had never seen anything like that before in his life, and it scared him, too. Um, things started happening, people screaming and yelling, um, cars being stolen. Um, there was the, I don't want to say the product because I don't want to get somebody in trouble, but a very famous drink company, um, energy drink company came in for the weekend and they had a uh, marketing seminar and had taken over the complex and they were playing the most awful music I've ever heard in my life. And we had a real estate agent at that time and he was helping us to buy the home of our dreams. And I said to the real estate agent, I said, about these people, I said, oh yeah, that's satanic. I said, what? He said, that, that's satanic music. I said, no, it's not satanic music. It's the worst stuff. I, I didn't know what satanic music sounds like. I had no idea. That's how loving our Father God was. The things that were going on around me, he kept me totally protected from what was going on. 
Soon after that, the lights started going off and on in the house. The pendulum fans would turn on and off. I could sit there and talk to the pendulum fan. I could ask questions, and the chain swinging from the fan would answer me, yes or no. And I thought, oh, wow, this is really cool. This place has got all kinds of spirits, and, and things are wonderful. But then my sister Dorothy, she, she said to me, um, Mary, there's high witchcraft going on around you. I, I didn't know what she was talking about. Of course, I've, I've heard of witchcraft, but I didn't really know what that meant other than bewitched on TV or something. I, I, I really honestly didn't know there was bad stuff out there. And Doylin was being called by God, and she was sort of whisked away from me a little bit because she was working with other sisters up in America, and I was down there uh, essentially alone. And there was this one particular day, I didn't tell you this part either, Joe, Father God is bringing up all kinds of things here. Um, there was a day a New Age person had sent me a piece of music from Buffalo, New York. And it was of a little girl singing a song. She was seven years old. It was the tears of little boy. And she, she was singing a song, Everything Will Be All Right. And... I'm looking at this beautiful child singing this song. She was seven years old and she was so happy and it was said, she said it could have been in Costa Rica. She was singing this song and it just, it took my breath away and I didn't understand why. And I kept watching the song over and over and over and I said, what does this matter to me? Why am I watching a seven year old child sing everything's going to be all right? What is this? And then I looked at what else she sang. And another song she sang was Any Dream Will Do. And I started to listen to that. Any Dream Will, Any Dream Will Do is from the musical production Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. And I had been in the Chicago theater the last night that Donny Osmond had sang in that theater production. And I fell in love with that song, Any Dream Will Do. And after that performance that night, I went out the back of the theater, and he was on the balcony, and I talked to him, Donny Osmond, my gosh, when I was a child, I was in love with that man, <laughs> and I talked to him from the balcony, and I said, thank you, I, I just fell in love with that song, and I asked him what it was, and he told me, any dream will do, so there I was in Costa Rica, listening to this little girl sing, any dream will do, and then I remembered that I'd been at the Chicago Theater. So I went to listen to Donny Osmond singing, and, and I'm listening to the song. And there's a part in the lyrics where it says, With a flash of light and a crash of drums. And at that very moment, a rainbow-colored laser beam light came in through the window and zapped my computer. I was sitting there, and I didn't know what was going on. It zapped my computer, and it turned it off. And the next part in the song was, may I take you back to the beginning? And the computer came on, and I'm sitting there shaking, thinking, what is going on here? And then I was just watching this song. Oh, this went on for hours, watching this song, and I was drinking beer. I was getting more and more upset. I was having flashback memories of my Nazi uncle raping me, and I was mad, and I could remember. He brought to my face details. I say he, because I know now it was Father God bringing my sins to me showing me what my uncle had done to me, things that I had done in my life, and I'm drinking the beer, and the lights are going on and off, and the fan pendulums are swinging, and I, my ex-companion was looking at me, what's the matter with you, and I'm yelling at him, and he's yelling at me, and he's yelling outside, and the lights are going on and off, and finally I went outside, I was typing furiously on Facebook, and Dory Lynn was on the other end, she was totally freaked out because I was going through something, I didn't know what it was, um, my daughter was writing stuff on Facebook. I told them all to get away. It was between me and God. And I went out and me. I yelled at God and screamed at him. How could you let this happen to a child? How can you let a child go through such torment? And, and I screamed and screamed. I was very upset. My sins were flying around me like... I had thoughts, I, nothing was coherent, I was drinking, I was screaming at God, and I sat down on a chair outside on the terrace, and all of a sudden, fairies were flying around me, 
and there were there was an orb of light that came in front of me, um, the size of a very large Christmas ornament, but clear. And in the middle of it were uh, what I call pretend feathers. And it, to me, it just was pretending to be an angel. And I was mad, and I was get away from me, and I was telling them to get away, and I just sucking everything away from me. I was so furious, and then by the time I was just spent. And I got up out of there because I didn't want to be in that dark corner with those things. And went over to the lighter part of the terrace. And I sat down on the chaise lounge. And I just looked up at the sky and I was crying. And I said, I am so sick to death of living in a world that doesn't care. I cannot live in one more moment in a world that does not care. I said, Jesus Christ, please come into my heart. And he did. I wish I could say I had immediate release and everything settled down but I can't because everything all hell broke loose then um, I was and that's a literal term because yeah. you just pissed the enemy off Amazing. You, you were you were owned by them you had given yourself to them whether unknowingly or knowingly in whatever instances as your story tells but yes all hell broke loose because they're fighting to keep you. Absolutely. And for me, I wish it could have been heaven opened up with the angels sang and, and I felt wonderful and, and because some people have stories like that. However, mine I knew he was there, but I didn't know him. I was scared to death of him. I'd only ever heard of but a Oh, God, that, you know, if you do something wrong, you're going to get hit by lightning. And then I remembered, of course, the lightning rearranging the beach. And I thought, oh, my gosh, is that God that did that or was it evil? I was so confused. I didn't know who to be more afraid of, God or Satan. And the two of them battled it out. I'm not kidding. Um, God was pulling me out. And there's a dear man in um, Los Angeles, California, that I wrote to also. And he... He wrote some emails to me, but there are two sentences that stood out that he wrote to me. And one was, Mary, God is pulling you out of the enemy's camp. And I hung on to that sentence. I hung on to those words because it gave me a visual of a huge white cord being let down from heaven. I grabbed onto that white cord with bloody fingernails. And as God was pulling me out of the camp, it was like I had layers and layers and layers of wallpaper around me. As God pulled the wallpaper all around me in the deep it was and it got pulled and pulled and stuff just kept happening and I couldn't get out of there quick enough I had to wait three weeks yeah we're losing communication with Mary hello hello something awfully strange has just happened um, this communication has been attacked by the enemy Fear, are you there Joe yeah, yeah I'm here yeah, exactly. At one hour, 11 minutes with 11 seconds, we were attacked. All right? Huh? Um, and that's a, a key code of uh, the evil one doing whatever he wants to do. Uh, that's a code that I broke uh, with regard to uh, Satan himself. So, yeah, I'm sorry for the interruption, but uh, your communication was being attacked. Oh, my uh, gosh, look at that. It is on there. It says 1.11.11.1. No, I put it on there right now, but just so you have an idea oh. that <laughs> this happened exactly at that time. You see, these mathematical markers are important because that's how the enemy works. Now, I know how he works, so, um, you know, uh, I don't want to offend you, Mary, in any way, but uh, as P.T. Barnum, Barnum used to say, there's a sucker born every minute, you know, and when we die uh, in... Uh, deviate from uh, from uh, Yeshua's plan and from God's uh, plan, uh, we end up falling into these hands uh, where people try to help us, these false teachers that are so abundant today. I mean, it's like a spiritual candy store. They're everywhere, you know. And sure. uh, remember that the enemy, Lucifer, has all flavors of teachers and preachers ready to fill your spiritual appetite with a very beautiful um, sugar-coated experience, you know. And uh, that's why we say test the spirits. And uh, similar to what happened to you, I ended up in Romania, believe it or not, in Bucharest. Uh, back in 99, I even, uh, uh, you know, had to leave my wife and everything 
because I was pulled in by a satanic ceremony that was being done against me. Finally, these people in uh, Romania confessed to me that they have been doing these rituals against me. Um, I had met the, these people online. And they did it to pull me in, you know. Um, and I got freed there because I prayed to I prayed to God back then, and He liberated me from that experience as well. So I I do connect a lot with your experience, uh, with what you went through in Costa Rica. But you know, the Lord does uh, work miracles when we truly accept Him in our heart. So that's a very touching uh, uh, ex experience that you shared with us, especially um, uh, everything that has to do with this New Age. Uh, movement that is um, being thrusted, you know, uh, to uh, um, bring people away from the true message of our Savior. Uh, when we talk about testing the spirits, uh, when we talk about Reiki and all these other New Age cults, for example, a Reiki master, when he was interviewed in the United States, when they asked him, you know, where does the power really come from uh, when you heal all these people? And it says, well, it comes from the ancient mystery. It comes from uh -huh. a, a ancient mystery schools, you know, Lemuria or Atlantis or, uh, you know, uh, all this uh, mumbo jumbo. Uh, but to really know uh, that it's not a mystery, if we study God's word, the Bible, to see what it has to say about such practices, we can come to uh, an answer. You see, but people are afraid to read the Bible, you know, people are afraid to read the scripture and discern for, them, for themselves, you know. Uh, when we ask questions such as, what spiritual doctrines are participants likely to be introduced to that have the potential to be spiritually harmful, you know, um, there are many uh, contrary uh, central doctrines within the New Age movement that basically say, no, nothing of this is, uh, is harmful when, when we know it's spiritual poison, you know. We end up committing uh, terrible mistakes, you know. When we evaluate anything that could potentially involve spiritual contact of any sort or that strays into any area of religious doctrines, it's very important to compare, uh, compare all of this to the Bible doctrines, you know, because uh, when we test the spirits, we can learn a lot from not... Uh, landing into this uh, type of phenomena. For example, um, w we have two girls, um, they're young, one is 22 and another one is 21, who contacted me last month from Mexico City and two months ago, I'm sorry. They had similar experiences um, to you. Down here, Joe, uh, Mary, in Mexico, there is a lot of tribal mixing with the New Age cult movement. Uh, tribal mixing would be going to Indian camps, indigenous camps, and participating in sweat lodges, opening up a hole into the earth, and asking the spirit mother to come through that and enter everybody's uh, body while they're suffocating with lack of oxygen from all these plants that are being poured into a, a fiery abyss, because that's what it is. And uh, the, the, the leader of the, of the shaman within this sweat lodge um, gets possessed by uh, uh, an entity and starts speaking to everybody of a secret message of that they should go out into the world and you should go to this part of the planet and you should go to this part of the planet and so on. And when we're really seeing... Uh, is entities, evil demonic entities, entering people's bodies, overtaking them because they are um, letting it happen. You know, that's a key point that you mentioned. Is like, uh, you ask for it. You are asking for this. And as Joe said, be careful what you ask for because it, uh, your wish will come true, you know. And in this case, uh, this is very akin. Uh, what would you say, Joe, to all the people, Mary, to the people in Mexico, in southern um, South America, that practice all these um, rituals based on tribalism and going all to these sweat lodges and becoming illuminated within there and liberating their spirit. What is your message to them to, so that they do not do this anymore? Well, I like to make a comment on this one, and this is an observation I made probably a decade, decade ago with uh, the, the co-founder of CE4 when I used to work with him. And this is something we started looking at, is people, want, and Mary hinted on this a little while ago in her, in her testimony, that the one thing in her life that was missing was true love. You know, and, and I guess at some point in our life, we always realize that we got this hole that needs to be filled. And we start looking for what is it that would fill this hole. 
Is it spending money and buying good things? Is it drugs? Is it, you know, what is it? Is it uh, secret knowledge? You know, we all look at these different things to try and fill that hole. And this is the enemy pulling us away from the one true thing that will fill the hole, which is the Word of God and the love of God. This is why this is the spiritual warfare. With these people that are allowing entities to come into them and not testing the spirits, which is what the Bible tells us to do, this is just like if you had somebody that came to your home and knocked on the door and you looked through your little eyepiece or whatever or you opened the door and you looked at this person and they're a total stranger and they said they're here for some reason and they need to come in your house. Are you going to say, sure, come on in? No, you're going to want some identification to verify who this person is. You're not just going to open your door with your kids in the house and just let a stranger walk in. You're going to check everything to make sure this is not some crazy coming in to do harm to you and your family. Am I right? Yeah, they absolutely. Have, yes, they have to learn. But these, uh, I'm sorry, Joe, just to uh, go in there. These people... But these people will allow these spirits who they cannot identify. They're seduced by the power that these entities are promising them. These special gifts that they don't even question and prove actual, get proof to who they really are. You know, they take the word that like in that, in that Kunlun camp that she was in, you know, that Jesus, this is Jesus, the spirit that's going to come. He comes here too. But did they test actually to see if it was him? If they knew scripture, they would know how to test. And that's something that people need to understand. That, you know, L.A. Marzulli calls it the guidebook to the supernatural. And it, it is a guidebook. The Bible is a guidebook on how to handle the supernatural. To test the spirits. And it gives a proper sequence on how you test these spirits because they have to respond in a proper way they can't they of course they'll say yes we know who jesus is you know we have no problem answering that question but is he your lord and master they can't answer that one jesus you know? warned yeah jesus warned in matthew 7 uh verse 15 through 16 beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but in ward inwardly they are ravenous wolves you will you will know them by their fruits, right? And um, absolutely, <clears throat> definitely. Uh, testing so that's spirits. that's yeah. my warning. These people, you need to be careful of what you're inviting into your mind and into your spirit, because you have to know who this entity is. You have to understand. And there's the evidence of the spirit itself is, as you will hear in the final part of Marie, or Mary's testimony is there is an absolute difference, and you can understand the counterfeit of the enemy compared to God's love, okay? And, and that's the difference. I mean, I, I came out of the New Age myself, and I actually had that initiation experience. And that initiation experience is actually termed a Luciferic initiation, okay, where you give in that spirit, you allow that spirit to become part of you. And... Uh, William Alnor termed that in the book that he wrote, dealing with all of this, Luciferic Initiation. And it's almost a complete counterfeit of the born-again experience that so many Christians describe happening to them. But it's an absolute counterfeit by the enemy. It was such a convincing counterfeit that I even called my own mother up, who was a, you know, a Christian all her life, and said, you know, I've had that experience. I've had the born-again experience, but it was a counterfeit. So, and it was years later before I could share the true experience of being born again. So any person that practices uh, says that they have psychic or occult powers, uh, they practice some form of magic or rituals, uh, they practice necromancy or tarot cards, um, or they practice Reiki. Uh, if, the, if you see these um, uh, signals in the change of attitude in a person, like a marked change in their intelligence or um, uh, a different strength, uh, um, or they have depression, despondency, suicidal tendencies, um, uh, filthy, uncontrolled swearing, radical change in personality, uh, all these people have... Uh, the elements of being um, uh, possessed, demonically possessed. Is that correct? That's correct. And I want to share a, a quick quote with you from, like I said, I mentioned the name Jack Vallee earlier when we started. Yes, of course. 
And this is a quote from Jack Vallée, from his research, from something he recognized about this experience. And this can go with all paranormal experience, but in this particular quote, he's talking about the UFO experience, which is a paranormal experience. He says, perhaps the most important effects from the UFO technology are the social ones and not the physical ones. In other words, the physical reality may serve only as a kind of triggering device to provide images for the witnesses to report. These perceptions are manipulated to create certain kinds of social effects. And that's what I believe that this entire UFO, alien abduction, paranormal experience is about is to change our mindset. That is the purpose of this delusion, this deception, is to take our eyes away from the one true God. Very good. It's his name, so be it. Yes, so be it. it. This is very important what you mentioned, because right now in the popular culture, we have Satan everywhere. We have Lady Gaga, Marilyn Manson. We have kids um, uh, in, the, in the potato chip bags in Mexico. They're putting all these demonic Pokemon uh, little plastic uh, uh, wafers what they, that they play with repeatedly in school. Um, aliens uh, in movies, Skyline, uh, Angels, Astrology, Astral Projection, Clairvoyance, cont Contacting the Dead, Seances. Uh, crystal consciousness, divination, energy healing, uh, evolutionism, feng shui, fortune teller, ghosts, Halloween. I mean, Christmas is even uh, a pagan ritual. Uh, haunted houses, uh, healing techniques uh, through the New Age system, horoscopes in our newspapers every day, uh, human or spiritual contacts, spiritual guides, hypnotism, which is very dangerous, uh, hypnosis, levitation, magic cards, um, all these, uh, uh, the Marian apparitions, which would be related probably to the paranormal. Um, Absolutely. Anything that is uh, supernatural in, in, in nature is either directly from the uh, most high God or directly from the lowest form, the lowest form, which Isaiah clearly states, um, uh, of Lucifer. So um, meditation, for example, near-death experiences, some of them, um, the orbs that people are seeing, you know, when I went to this New Age uh, conference up in L.A. In, in August of this year, and I was deprogramming the people, they took pictures of us up on stage, there, uh, there was a Satanist on, on uh, he was a keynote speaker, he had a, uh, a pentagram on a black t-shirt speaking to the people, he's, he's called the, the, the Elder Witch, you know, that's his name. In Spanish, uh, Brujo Mayor, and uh, th this guy was tremendous because uh, he he clashed with me uh, while he was giving me a uh, a certificate of participation in the event. <laughs> and th this man said, uh, "I will never forget." It. He said, "I don't I, I I don't believe that God exists. All right, I do know that there is a force in the universe, but I truly truly do not believe God exists." You're a very smart man, and thank you very much for participating. And I told him, "Well." There's a very big difference between white and black, I said to the audience. You see, white is a real color. Black is the absence of white. So Absence of all color. Of all and everything. And that's the duality matrix that we're living in. I mean, it's a, it's a programming system. I mean, this is Lucifer's world, okay? People need to understand that, that the programming is embedded everywhere in our products. Everything we buy, everything we see, TV, throw it away. People need to react now because our children are at risk of all this programming, embedded programming, Satan's beast system, I call it, you know, uh, the beastocracy of embedding information, overlaying information, programming the subconscious, Harry Potter, and all this stuff, uh, bringing them, enticing them into the occult, the Ouija, with the Ouija boards that are being sold in our supermarkets, here in the game section, in the game board section, I mean, all this is happening right now, and people are falling uh, by the millions. You know, my son, Alexander, I'm going to share this with you now. He's nine years old. He was contacted by Yeshua when he was four years old. Mary, you'd love this story. Uh, he brought me back to Yeshua. Uh, he told me, you know, Dad, I had a dream, and God took me. What do you mean God took you? Yeah, well, he took me, and he showed me who he really was. And I said, could you draw a picture? And he, draw he drew 
uh, Jesus Christ, and there was a rainbow over him, and he had a sword in his hand. I'm like, yeah, oh. sure, right? Uh, I was in the New Age back then, you know? This was back in <laughs> 2004, 2005, and, and, and I said, yeah, sure, son, you know, the sun is God, you know? I was saying, it was, it was Ra. Ra is a real power. I'm like, <laughs> and then, no, Dad, this is God. This, I saw him. He talked to me. Okay, once I accepted Yeshua, he said, you see, I told you, Dad. You see, you're my brother. You're not even my dad. My real father is up in heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. And he never read the Bible. Uh, I mean, uh, aside from that, he had a dream three weeks ago where the Spirit took him, the Spirit of God took him, um, and he showed him hell. And that really freaked me out. I mean, uh, it gives me comfort to know that he's being prepared by, by Jesus himself, but... He said, Dad, you know, Joshua took me down to hell and he showed me, and he said, and I asked him, what did he show you? He showed me, you know, millions and millions of people falling to these, like, pools of magma, he said. And uh, these pools of magma, Dad, all the people are falling in there. It's horrible, Dad. And uh, Jesus said, don't worry, nothing will happen to you. I'm protecting you. And he told me, tell the people that this is going to happen very soon, very soon. And he said, prepare yourself. This is happening soon. And then he woke up. But he, he woke up at 6 a.m. like sh visibly shaken from the experience. All day long he couldn't think of anything except uh, that experience. And it really um, shook us up as a family. And we started praying all day long. Uh, just to to think of a of a of an innocent child being taken by Jesus, you know, to show him the demo version of what's go going to happen to most of the people that are uh, embedded in this type of system. The Urantia book. A lot of people email us. Uh, the Urantia book says that Jesus Christ is the Archangel Michael, Alexander. Um, this is real. What what's wrong with you? Why are you a Christian all of a sudden? Well. Look, Urantia was a channeled book in the 1950s in, in Chicago. It's part of the New Age cult. I don't go into that, please, okay? So that's, that's my comment up to there. I'm sorry. Let's, let's go back to you to see uh, your feedback on that, Mary. Oh, my feedback on what? My goodness. Well, <laughs> well continue, continue on. Right now you're, you're coming to the Lord. And, and what the listeners Amen. need to hear, we've, we, we, we've heard a lot of your testimony and... There's a lot of, you know, it, it leaves you with a feeling of being dirty because of what you've, what you've shared with us. Now what you want to do is show these people that with all you've been through, that you found hope. And that's where the evidence itself comes in. So these people can understand through your words that you are a person who's been set free. And that's the Amen. hope that they need to hear, because this is the evidence. Yes, absolutely. As Luke, yes, as Luke uh, ten nineteen says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be... And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You see? So we have power over this. Uh, we have power once we accept uh, Yeshua HaMashiach in our hearts. And that brings us to uh, a prayer that changes our eternal destiny for all of those that are still uh, embedded in the, uh, in the control mechanism of Lucifer. Please, Father, I thank you that Jesus died for me. I confess I have broken your loss. Forgive my sins. I receive the pardon right now. Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua Mashiach, come into my life. Give me a new heart with new desires. And by your spirit, give me the power to live a life that is pleasing to you, Father. Thank you for forgiving me as you promised. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. You know, when we, when do, we do this, when we understand grace, when we listen to Paul who walked with Yeshua, uh, when we, we really understand the law and we li really live a Christian life, when we are obedient under the grace of God. Uh, I know it's easy to get lost. I know it's easy to practice Christmas or Halloween. But you have to get out of that uh, vicious cycle and start really living your life in the Spirit of God, in His name, and really preparing for the spiritual, uh, the spiritual warfare which we are uh, ha having right now, I mean, as we speak. Go ahead, Mary. 
I'm not sure where we left off with well, the testimony. So well, you had just come to to accepting Jesus Christ, and you were you were sharing how you know it wasn't angels in heaven singing choruses, but the battle had you know just increased on you. Oh, but yes. but you're now in under his under his arm. Yes. Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have left, so maybe I'll skip over some and, and come to the fall of this year. Is that... Sure. Sure. We have about 20 minutes left, 25 minutes. Go ahead. Okay. We'll have to skip then. The Lord pulled me out of Costa Rica on the 17th of March this year. And from there, we went to Arizona, California. I went to Minnesota. I went to St. Louis, Missouri. And then I was in Greenville, Illinois. And then Father God brought me up to back home to Canada, to my mother's home in Ontario, on the 2nd of July this year. And I had six weeks with my mother, and I tried valiantly to um, bring her to Jesus. Um, as I said in the beginning of the testimony, she was a Roman Catholic, and they excommunicated her, and she walked away from from God, but we had many, many discussions about God, and I pray that when she died, that she went to the Lord. She she had tears coming from her eyes 20 minutes before she died. I was I asked Father to take me to a piece of scripture in the Bible. I, I don't even know where that scripture is today. Maybe you could tell me, but it's a part in the Bible where a mother and a daughter are talking, and there's a tree, and I read this part in the Bible, and my mom, she cried. Um, she had she was unconscious with her mouth open and her eyes open and an oxygen mask over her face, and she cried. And I, I like to think that the Lord was with her at that point and that he took her because I honestly don't know. Uh, then my brother from Alberta had to come uh, upon the death of our mother because he was executor to the estate. And it was very difficult. We were selling the house. There were all kinds of people running through the house. There were spirits all through the house. My my brother is an atheist, so he had stuff of his own. I was grieving my mother. I was still upset, but I knew the Lord was with me, but something still just wasn't quite right. I just, I saw people around me, other Christians. I had the light in my face. I was being protected in many ways, but something still wasn't quite right. I'd look at other Christians, they'd be laughing, and their lives were carefree, and I was like, I know what that is wrong with me. Why? I'm born again. And I became involved with UFOs, and I hadn't seen any since, um, when was the last time I saw them? Minnesota, I think, was the last time I saw any. And I believe that's right. Anyhow, I got involved in working in this UFO project, and I went outside in the evening one night, and I looked up, and there was a UFO, and I thought, oh, my gosh, here it is, September, and I'm seeing UFOs. Why am I seeing this again? I'm born again. This stuff is supposed to go away. And I called out the name of the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It took me several tries to, to get it to go away because we're instructed that if we cry out the name of Jesus, it, the demons and spirits have to flee. In fact, this is scripture, uh, Ephesians 6.19. I don't have it in front of me, but it's it's basically where it tells us that the, the, the very name, the very utterance of Jesus' name. I have it right how, here. I have it right here if you want me uh, yes, to, please to read it. it. Please. Ephesians yes. 19? 6.19. Okay. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. And the mystery he is speaking is Jesus Christ. We call out his name, and the demons and the spirits have to flee. But that night I was calling his name, Jesus, Jesus, and it wasn't working. I thought, there's something wrong. What is wrong? And I was really upset. And I went to bed that night, and I woke up, so to speak, in the middle of the night, and I was doing what women do when they are with their husbands in their bed, and I had to get deliverance the next day through an online ministry. Our pastor, Pat Halliday, and she told me, 
that what I was describing to her was I was being raped by demons. And I thought, what is going on? This is not right. I'm a child of God. I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart. There's something wrong. This is not supposed to be happening. The UFOs are supposed to go away. The spirits are supposed to go away. And when I cry out his name, they're supposed to go away. And Father took me to the Word. I asked him, Father, what's wrong? What am I doing wrong? And he took me to the Bible. And in Matthew 17, the disciples come to Jesus and say, Jesus, Jesus, Lord, Lord, this man has a demon in him. We cannot cast him out. And Jesus said to them, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And the disciples said, But Lord, why can we not cast him out? And Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. I went, Oh my goodness. I believed more in Satan than I did the world. I was putting all my energy into this UFO project and the UFOs up in the sky and the spirits, and I wasn't paying attention to the Lord. I was spending more time on the other side than I was with him. And at that moment, it was just, all of a sudden, the light shone. And I felt clean for the very first time. Something changed. I apologized to the Lord, and I realized that the dark side was still sucking me into a vortex of paying attention to them. When all I should have been doing as a new Christian is developing my relationship with him. As soon as I realized that, things changed. I, I was looking even at other Christians, and I could see there was something not quite right. And it was a shadow. There were a shadow over these people that believe in UFOs and believe in the power of Satan and watch people that are out screaming, wake up people, wake up, the UFOs. Are I, I started seeing them very differently, and I, I felt free. I felt at peace. It all went away. All of it went away. And that is the power of our Lord. And when we believe in him, we truly are born again and free. But I was inside the delusion still, because I was believing in the UFOs. I was believing more in that side than I was of the Lord. As soon as my eyes were turned, that was it. I was a whole new person. You know, I'd like to, to comment in here where she's at, Alexander. Yes, please. On my website, I have what is called the eight R's to freedom. And... That is a very important guideline for people that want to have something that's useful to help them in their progression of being set free from, you know, their connectedness to the, to the dark side once they become a believer. And I've seen Mary go through all of these steps. And the eight R's, you know, it's, it's recognize what's been happening, what you've been involved with, and then... The next star is you want to make sure that you do something about it, okay? And then it takes you right on down the line through repentance. And then um, the, the, the one that's the hardest for these people to go through of the eight R's is the fifth one. It's called remove it. And it means take everything you've had connected to this dark side and remove it from your life. And what we're seeing that... But what I've been seeing over the past few years is a danger um, to a lot of new believers that I've worked with coming out of the New Age and, the, and uh, the metaphysical realm and the paranormal realm and the occult realm. Here we are as Christians trying to show them they've been deceived by these demonic spirits. And we bring them to the base of the cross of Jesus Christ and his saving grace. And now they become Christians. But then what I see happens is they get introduced to all of these other things in Christian name, okay? Studies of stuff that deals with bizarre subjects that people are teaching from a Christian perspective, you know, of serpent seed, of hollow earth, of 
Nephilim hybrids roaming the earth, of satanic super soldiers, all of these type of things, they get sucked right back into instead of taking the time to actually heal and let the Lord speak to them and set them completely free. You know, when we were in the New Age, we were chasing, and the people that are listening to this that are involved in the New Age know the term, the search for enlightenment. That's the ultimate goal, is to reach enlightenment. And that search for enlightenment is like chasing a carrot on a stick. And you can never reach that carrot. It's constantly one new piece of secret knowledge after the other. As soon as you think you've, you've achieved something and you hear that word nirvana, all of a sudden somebody else comes along and shares another piece of that secret knowledge with you. So it's a works-based religion, in essence, that you can never achieve all of the works. It just keeps you chasing the carrot down the rabbit hole. And what's happening is I've seen the enemy infiltrate this Christian realm in the same way. And instead of being able to get these people grounded in, into a church, which is what we try to do, and into a fellowship of other Christian believers, the enemy's right there going, hey, look at this, hey, look at this, hey, look at this. And it's just another carrot on a stick, but it has the term Christianity written on it. So they think it's okay to go chase that. And they end up spending all of their time chasing this, these carrots in the name of Christianity, but it's not doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, which is getting grounded in God's word and into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's the danger that she became involved with. And once she was able to have the Lord open her eyes to that's what she had done after becoming a brand new Christian, was go right back chasing that carrot again, but in the name of Christianity, when the Lord opened her eyes and she was able to go, thank you, Lord, I see this, and she was able to step back, that's what she's describing as finally total freedom. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, I, 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 we have the eight R's to freedom uh, uh, in Spanish. We're just proofreading it. Uh, we're going to be having all that information up on our site in your section, Joe uh, okay. and Mary, uh, especially the eight R's to freedom. Uh, listeners, please download that in Spanish. Uh, get it to the people that need help. They, they are eight steps. You need to recognize uh, what you're doing, recognize the enemy at hand, take responsibility for this, accept the responsibility of uh, uh, what has happened, um, repent, and this is very important. We have a special prayer for repenting, um, and you need to understand that prayer and do it diligently and accept it in your heart. Renounce, okay? You have to let go. Uh, you may, need to make that moment of what you just recognized, you need to make it your enemy. Accept the enemy. And you will see it in a clear light how all these people are really truly lost. They are lost. Uh, and you will start seeing that there is no such thing as spaceships coming down from the sky, people being evacuated from the planet in an imminent um, uh, Earth cataclysm scenario, nothing like that. Uh, and resist, okay? Resist when the attacks come. And something that I learned, uh, uh, Joe and Mary, from resisting this, because I've been attacked. I mean, I've, I've been trying to be, uh, to be sucked back into this uh, constantly. And one one of the things that I learned, uh, I'm sorry for the for the for the interruption okay. there. Uh, one of the things that I learned about resisting is uh, we can't uh, we can't forget it, okay? Because it, it it's affected each one of us as victims of this um, of this attack of Satan upon the people of the earth. But we we can we can. We can forgive and forget in the, se in the sense that the word forget teaches us to go get something and replace it for something else. So replace all of that uh, negative programming with positive program programming. Like start praying when you feel an attack coming upon you or you feel um, somebody trying to suck you into the, uh, to the same philosophy or idea. Or when you go to a neighbor's house and he's having satanic music being played. I mean, just start attacking that. And that's spiritual warfare right there. The, the beginning portion of, 
of what spiritual warfare is about, using the word of God against the enemy. Then the seventh step would be rejoicing, giving God thanks for setting you free, and you will feel his love and his presence when you do that, and then restore. You need to help somebody else get free as well, and that's what we're doing right now. Exactly. That's what we're doing right now. The most important thing we can do is take what we've learned and given freely from Jesus Christ and help share with somebody else. And through these types of shows that you have, Alexander, and opening this up to a whole new realm for us to reach in the Spanish-speaking community, that they can hear this in their own language. We can take this simple testimony of what Mary's been through and she can share this to help somebody else get free. There will be thousands upon thousands of people that will hear this show. And they'll be able to hear. And they'll be able to be able to understand that there is a hope for what they've been involved with. And that hope is evidenced through Mary's testimony. Amen. Amen. Praise Jesus. Yes, yeah, always. Mary, uh, I'm so happy that you could share your experience with us today. And uh, so we could learn more about uh, what you went through, what I've gone through, what Joe's gone through. Everybody, you know, we, we all got sucked into this. But you, you need to understand that though Satan is real and uh, he will bring grave deception and destruction to the world, uh, because of those uh, who embrace him, his fate is clear. And one day, the totality of all the fallen uh, angels, okay, and his radical evil will be ended on this planet. So if you're in this dark camp, you're lost, you're seeking a new name in the Galactic Federation, and you think a star is coming down, or he's already inside Mount Shasta, waiting to come out uh, on the in, in Colorado or something, and the new pyramids of light are going to be uh, shown upon the world, uh, all that is a lie, it's a deception, because there's, the only thing that's under Mount Shasta is a volcano. And what we're seeing right now in Revelations 9 uh, is the opening of the abyss, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, we are in the pre-tribulation time right now. We're going into the Great Tribulation. You need to understand these, these important things in biblical prophecy. We urge you to get out now of all of this, okay? Because there's going to be a coming day when you're not going to be able to do it. That's when Lucifer... Yes, in the flesh will take a body on this planet called the Antichrist or the Pseudo-Christ, and he will wreak havoc upon this planet. You know, I saw it, and he, the Lord showed me this. We will see people hanging from uh, uh, lamp uh, lamp posts all over the, the countries, you know, on this planet, committing suicide, massive suicides because of what's going on in the world. And if you, if you think the chaos right now, for example, in Mexico, we got more than 36,000 people killed in the last four years. is uh, This is small in comparison to what is going to happen in the future. Please repent now, because the work of Jesus Christ and the blood He shed can really truly set you free and bring you the true power, the true love, and the future that you need, which is salvation in His name. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, so be it. I just want to say one thing, that there's a lot of people out there searching for love, searching for the one true thing, and I urge people, take a look, good look at your lives. Nothing else has worked up to now. Why not give Jesus a try? Ask Jesus to come and see you. Talk to him. He will. He loves you so much. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, Alexander, this yes. has been one awesome, powerful show. Yes, it has. And I think your listeners will greatly enjoy this show. And I welcome them to, you know, contact you. Um, I don't speak Spanish myself, but I think you can be a great, you know, intermediate there between uh, those that want to get in touch with me. I know that you're translating these shows and you've done one of the videos um, already, and you have it up on your Vimeo link where you can see the presentation and they can see the, the testimonies themselves as I bring them up at the end. You know, when I do my talks, I never rely on saying, Trust me, I always bring living evidence 
so that people can meet them in person because it's truly a life changed is the evidence. And they must meet these people to know that they're real. You know, it's not just stories they're reading about in a book. You know, but these people are real people. What you've heard tonight, Mary, is a real person. Mary's telling you what her life has been like and what it's now like through Jesus Christ. This is the true evidence and the true power over these entities. In the UFO realm, there's a lot of talk of disclosure, 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 about government disclosure, finally giving us the truth that we've been in contact with extraterrestrials. Well, excuse me, we're still waiting on that disclosure. But these people, like Mary, these testimonies that have been set free from this experience, they have their disclosure. They can tell you that disclosure has been had. We do have our answer. And there is evidence for it. And what you're ex what these people out there are experiencing are just lying signs and wonders, which was prophesied to happen. And that's what you're experiencing. You want to see the true love, like Mary said, Ask Jesus Christ. Test that spirit at least. If you're not going to test the other ones, test that one. And he'll be right there for you. And he'll show you a real experience, a real life-changing experience. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen for that. What? Wonderful. What to look for in the days ahead. I mean, we're going to be... Uh, living interesting, interesting moments, and we, as your soldiers, Father, uh, understand the message that you laid upon us when you talked to us about the the parable you left on that you are the the grapevine, that you are the true life, the true salvation through your name, and that you are our best friend, Father. And yes, we fear the Lord because we respect the Lord, but we do not fear the acts of man. Those who fear the acts of man are really fearing um, uh, Lucifer himself. We don't fear Lucifer. We fear our God. Why? Because we know that he will come. And that's the day when we all shall go home back together once again. I hope so. Uh, we want to thank Maximilian Utis in Argentina for subtitling um, The Spiritual Nature of Abduction. Uh, the Unholy Communion of Joe Jordan at C4 Research Group. Um, we want to also thank you, Mary L. Porter, for being on the show with us today. And Joe Jordan from C4 Research, thank you so much because, I mean, this show is going to go around the world. A lot of people are going to question it, and that's what we want. We want you to question the evidence. We want you to do the research, people, instead of just attacking our website and attacking our work. You just can't just attack without uh, a basis. Remember that the highest, the highest form of ignorance, okay, is 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 that done without diligent research, okay? And Albert Einstein used to say that, okay. So please don't be ignorant. Just accept and do the research. And uh, this, um, I would like to dedicate this show specifically to the Cordero family in Mexico City who has been under attack for many many years, and now they are freed. Thanks to your message, Joe. Thanks for your message, Mary, because you're helping so many people you can't imagine. Uh, that's that's my message for now. Thank you. God bless you. Joe, Mary, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you, Alexander, and God bless you and your family. Thank you very much, Alexander. Bye, can deals. Aha, gracias. And whenever you need anything down here in Mexico, we are here to help. Alexander, I'd like to give one closing comment for your show. And I, this is something I use in a lot of my talks that I do. I like to make sure that I close in this manner. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, Lord God, King and Ruler of the Universe. Amen. El Olam Achmei. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. God bless you. I sent you an invite to talk to me again someday. Sure. Talk to you soon, Mary. Uh, do you have an email address, Mary, so we can give out to our listeners? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, Mary, M-A-R-Y, capital L, capital P, capital P, 48, at yahoo.com. Great. Excellent. And, Joe, uh, we already have your website on our site, concisiaradio.com. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. And we'll do this again. Just let me know. 
Okay, of course we will. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you, sir. Uh, likewise. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Alexander Backman, signing off for ConsciencialRadio.com.